If I were a praying man, I'd pray this journal finds its way to you. Trusting that it will, I will use these last words to pass down a means of carving the bond between myself and my partner into this flesh. This is how it is done. And in all, there are a great many paintings depicting all manner of hells. But I think real hell might be closer to something like this. Long ago, too long ago, I used to think like you. Indeed, it led me to climb the world tree. However, I did not find Elysium or the architect. I believe it was because I was unworthy. Watch humans closely and you'll learn one thing. Deep down, they wish they were dead. They kill each other like they swat flies, running towards oblivion like blind rats. They see the divine flame of life and piss over it. <laughs> They're genius at that. In a class all of their own, really. Oh, that flame is wasted on them. So I, I want to give them a little push in the right direction as the benevolent servant of our wise dad, sure. The name's Malos. I'm the same as you. Xenoblade Chronicles 2 is a simple story about a boy meeting a girl. At its core the game explores how the connections between people can change the individual, but also the stagnation that comes from isolating oneself from the outside world. In a broader sense it is a story about the conflicts between order versus chaos, dualism and monism, and how our bonds make us greater than the sum of our parts, not despite, but because of people's individual differences. This theme is reflected upon throughout every facet of this work, from the duality of Pyra and Mithra, to the relationship between drivers and blades in the world of Elrest itself. Even the game's connection to the original Xenoblade plays into this overarching narrative. Yet nowhere is this central theme more immediately apparent than in its gameplay where it is embedded into the very foundation of the game's combat system. You! What? Incredible! You! Both of you! Huh? That last attack? The force behind it was absurd. I'm amazed! Oh, uh, really? Well, that's just... <laughs> oh, and passing the weapon. What a concept! How did you ever come up with that idea? Oh, well... We were broke. Huh? We couldn't afford meals, let alone another sword. And so we made do. <laughs> You're kidding! <laughs> oh man, you guys are the best! I haven't laughed this hard in ages! Huh? I really, really like you two! Uh... In many ways the cooperation between Driver and Blade is portrayed more akin to an elaborate dance than an actual fighting style. By using their Blade's weapons Drivers compress the ether existing within the atmosphere into their weapon, so the Blades can unleash powerful abilities. Thus, only by working together within their unique roles, are both of them able to reach their full potential. This idea of dialectic opposites working towards a greater whole is also reflected in the game's fusion combo mechanic. 
By combining both blade combos and driver combos players can create powerful fusion attacks which are easily among the strongest tools in their repertoire. Just as the player has to master both drivers and blades, learning to differentiate their unique roles is also one of the major thematic gameplay elements within the game's prequel story Torna, The Golden Country. This is represented in the constant switching of vanguard and rearguard, as the characters themselves are still looking for their role, both in and out of combat. Here 500 years before the start of the main game blades are still using a fighting style identically to that of their drivers and the weapon passing technique is seen as a new and revolutionary concept, to the point of even being interpreted as symbolic of the true purpose behind the bond between driver and blade. Your sword swapping fighting style. It's very interesting, you know. It's still quite rough, though. I'm a bit lacking in oomph. It'll take me a while to get it down properly. See, I wasn't actually talking about the power or technique. Oh? What then? That connection you have. Human and blade. It's like a bond of sorts. I just found it curious. An actual... Bond. It's like that's how it's supposed to be. This dichotomy of monism and dualism is not only represented by the relationships between drivers and blades but also by how the protagonists are contrasted against the game's antagonists. While the protagonist consists of drivers and blades cooperating with one another in the intended way, all the major antagonists within the story are either flesh eaters or blade eaters, both of which have in some sense unified the opposites of driver and blade into one being, and with that rejected the natural distinction between the two. Thus the protagonists serve as a reflection of the dualistic worldview while the antagonists are an embodiment of monism. In a broader sense this is indicative of the character's different interpretations of higher morality, of good and evil, as either universal constants or purely man-made concepts. But more on that later. Even as the only flesh eater on the side of the protagonist, Nia still acts as a regular blade for Rex, even though she would technically be perfectly capable of fighting by herself or using Dramark's weapons while in her blade form. Even though Nia shows us to be someone else's blade, she still obtained independence from other humans. The thematic significance of this gameplay restriction is empathized in Jin's final moments. Thanks, guys. Thanks for sharing with me. So, what made you ask? I'm a flesh eater. So, I don't know how long I'll live for. I mean, for all I know, I might just sniff it tomorrow. My lady. But I can say this much. My life and death isn't tied to any human. And? It's Jin. I've been wondering. Jin was collecting core crystals. But why didn't he use them? Doesn't he hate humans? He could use them to create blades, then turn them into flesh eaters. He could expand Torna with no need for humans in the mix. They do lack numbers. Is that all of them? Yeah. It's just the five of them. That's it. When Malos suggested getting Obrona and Akos to resonate, Jin was dead against it. So I think maybe... Maybe... Jin fears the same way as us. The same way as us? I think maybe... That's why he won't resonate with anyone. Nia represents the individuality and identity, obtained by choosing to be someone else's blade. The exact same form of freedom Malas has been searching for the entire time and eventually found by choosing to be Jin's blade, by finding his own purpose to follow the drive instilled within him through Amalthus. This is reflected in the unique contrast between Nia's and Malas' respective abilities. One has found their purpose in siding with Gin's desire for destruction the other in Rex's desire to heal the world, which is indicative of the polar opposite between Malas and Rex's moral compass by the end of the story. While we are already talking about everyone's favorite Welsh cat girl let's take a closer look at her character. 
just to establish how even some of the game's goofiest moments tend to have a lot of meaning and foreshadowing in them that gives a glimpse at the person behind the facade. Upon first entering Torgathnia seems saddened that the town hasn't changed since she last been here, which plays not only into her search for a home but is indicative of the stagnant nature of the world itself. The hostility and alienation she feels radiating from Torgath is further embodied through Morardane's hostile takeover, making the state of the city itself a reflection of the lost home or finding a place to belong theme that is at the core of not only Nia's character arc, but the larger thematic core of the work. In general the game is extremely silly and doesn't take itself too serious. However the same story could have easily been presented as a much darker game without really changing any of the story beats themselves as the events and themes themselves are actually pretty messed up at times. Whether or not one likes this more light-hearted approach is ultimately up to personal preference. However I think it goes well with the game's overall idea of letting good be, while accepting that bad things exists, and not taking oneself too serious. This scene is immediately followed by Nia noticing the wanted poster that conflates her appearance with draw marks. While this scene is portrayed as comedic or reaction to it also reflects on her nature as a flesh eater and how she feels rejected by the world at large. Because deep down she fears that the world does see her as the monster depicted in the painting. So while comedic the scene also shows a violent outburst of emotion she bottled up deep within. Neo also displayed a similar reaction to being called a monster during the excavation of the ancient vessel. Don't tell me this is meant to be me! A remarkable likeness, to say the least. Oi, did you say something? Uh, no. I fear they may have conflated our countenances, my lady. How very awful. So ruthless. It's like they're monsters themselves. Nice. I'm sure glad these drivers are on our side. You too, Dromark. No need to get hysterical. It was a walk in the park. Yeah, but still. That's enough yapping, you pair of brats. Let's move! While on the topic, Another instance of purposeful comedy is the scene of Poppy and Rex lifting up Pyra. While you could say that it is metaphorical of Rex's inability to carry Pyra's burden it really serves to establish Poppy's booster mode but more importantly her immense physical strength, which becomes vital in toppling the water tower in their fight against Morag. So, while the silly scenes are mostly just there to give the characters room to breathe and interact, they also tend to establish and hint at other aspects of the story. Whether or not the jokes land with the player, the scenes do tend to have more purpose than just being silly for the sake of being silly. But yes, the game also taking the piss as one of its major themes is not taking oneself too serious, as seen in the antagonists thinking that they are acting out of some higher purpose. Poppy pull Pyra up! Please! Grab again! Nice, Poppy! Poppy Artificial Blade! This is no problem! Poppy could lift Gonzalez if necessary! Nia's fear of rejection is also what led to Van Herm's death as she didn't want to expose her true nature until finally overcoming her fears inside the spirit crucible. The sassy Nia we see in the first six chapters is mostly a facade that hides her own insecurities which is slowly stripped away throughout the spirit crucible at which point she, as a flesh eater becomes Rex's blade. So her awakened nature reflects on Rex's awakening as master driver, understanding the true bonds between driver and blade by being able to bond with a flesh eater as driver and blade, while the members of Torna refuse to resonate with anyone. Let's give him hell! Ready? Ready. 
The second time Nia is saved from prison it is not by the hands of another flesh eater, an isolated group wallowing in its own self-pity, but by a human reaching out to her. It is this difference, this dualistic nature between the two which eventually allows Nia's emotional wounds to heal over time. You alright Nia? Rex, you... My lady, apologies for my late arrival. Don't mention it. I didn't think anyone was coming at all. As if we'd leave you. Always help those who help you. That's the second rule of the Salvages Code. Well, that's you all over, ain't it? After witnessing the driver requirement in Twerget, Nia is also the first one to suggest leaving instead of watching the celebration ceremony, a ceremony that Tour, at this point in time, and the other members of Twerget would seem more like a prison sentence, as they witness another play being enslaved by humans. Much later in the story Nia makes it abundantly clear that she values her independence from humans. While she ultimately disagrees with Gin's view of the world she also doesn't believe in the forced bond between drivers and blades, instead wishing to form that bond by her own free will. As blades are shaped by the unconscious influences of their drivers, they serve as sort of an embodiment for their drivers Yung Yi and Shadow, the subconscious hidden part of their driver's psyche. Nia's repressed desire to be someone's blade is manifested in the the extreme loyalty displayed by drama. Similarly all other blades also express attributes about their drivers that are hidden behind the surface. For Morag, who was raised as a replacement for the Emperor's male heir, it is presented in Bride's extreme femininity in search for her past identity. For Zeke, who became a jaded ironic Chuni after failing in his naive quest to fix the world, Pandoria is literally the lighting trapped inside of a bottle. More on that later, as we'll unravel those two characters in much more detail later. For now all that matters is that Blades serve as an expression of their driver's eyed shadow and as such drivers and Blades really have to be examined as two sides of the same coin, which is indicative of the true bond between the two. This psychological aspect to the Blades is crucial to the larger thematic purpose behind the roles of Lagos and Numa as overseers of the Blade system. The safety measures implemented by Klaus and the kinds of people are unable to awaken Blades due to their lack of aptitude, and the fact that the number of people with this potential is continuously shrinking, is indicative of the mental downward spiral of the people of Ailrest, as they draw ever closer to another all-out war similar to the one that destroyed Mortha. core crystal turn into a weapon? That is how blades are born, Rex. What? But when I touch Pyra's... She's a special case. Pyra's the Aegis, remember? So the usual rules don't apply. All that business with sharing her life force, it's not exactly normal. Wait, what does the Aegis even mean? Jin and Malos, they called her that too. Dunno. All I know is that it's some kind of legendary blade. Why don't you just ask her yourself? Let's go. No point sticking around for the enrollment ceremony and all that boring stuff. By acting as the Zanza figure of this world and slowly strangling it to death, Amalthus is not only physically but also psychologically transforming the world into a second Mortha as more and more people begin to think like Klaus and become rejected by the Blade system, leading to more and more core cleansing, in a self-destructive cycle of moral decay. In fact Blades weren't even originally born with the ability to spawn weapons. This is an attribute that was developed over time, likely due to the nature of humanity and the ever-looming threat of an all-out war within Ilrest. This piece of lore was only referenced in some small flavor texts that were published before the release of the game. To my knowledge it is never mentioned in the actual game itself, so it might not even be considered canon anymore. But this just makes it all the more interesting that Malas' weapon manifested as, and explicitly referred to as a Monado. Even though Malas is Jin's metaphorical blade, the weapon that swore to fulfill Jin's wish, the two do not actually fight as a driver and blade and still have this disconnect between them representative of the unhealthy relationship between the two. 
their unique bond, which gives them a misguided goal, that becomes Malas' proof of his own free will is perhaps best described as misery loves company. Malas' usage of the Monado also serves as a subversion to the story of the first Xenoblade, by putting the weapon into the hands of the antagonist further empathizing the antagonist's connection to monism and his bondage to the will of a false god, and the flipped nature of the two parallel universes. In a sense even the connection between Xenoblade 1 and 2 follows the same principle as the bond between Driver and Blade, not least due to Zanz's nature as Klaus Jung and Eid. Is that... part of your dream too? What are we in the end? This hunger I feel, this thirst, is it really my own? Or is it someone else's? Sometimes I can't tell. Tell me, Jin. Are you really here? I don't know... where I really am. You're starting to sound like a human. Oh yeah? Perhaps we're not so different after all. Humans and blades. The Monado's namesake is derived from the Monad, a term used to describe both an indivisible unit, and more importantly the Gnostic idea of an impersonal god that exists beyond the creator of our physical reality, that is the false god or Demiurge, who is associated with Aeon, Saturninus and Ualda both among others. In its simplest terms the Monad is the unity of opposites, the knowledge of both good and evil, but more on that later. Unlike the original Xenoblade in which Zanza represented this pure chaos born from Klaus megalomania of believing his experiment to be successful, in Xenoblade 2 the creator god does instead represent a force of pure order born from remorse of the reality behind Klaus' actions. The end of both sides of Klaus become detached from their human roots by thinking they have gained a higher understanding of the true nature of the world, yet through their respective actions and inactions they both end up repeating and enabling the cycle of destruction they created, as both Zanza and the Architect are two different expression of the absolute extremes that lurk within man. Rather than commenting on the true nature of God, the symbol of the Demiurge as it appears in Zena Blade, does instead serve as a reflection on the nature of mankind, and the misguided individual deeming their interpretation of morality to be ultimate truth. In the end the both halves of Klaus are unable to change humanity's fate. And it is only once Rex and Shulk reawaken the Condit and Alvis from their slumber and reach their apotheosis, that the true Minato can awaken and reshape reality. This takes place when Shulk forgives Aegil leading to his separation from Zanza and his bond with Alvis, and when Rex reforges his bond with Pyra and Mithra thus awakening Numa and the Condit, both initiated by accepting the great tainted nature of morality on the level of the individuals. To incomplete halves reaching a synthesis embodied through the bond between driver and blade. Then there's only one choice. I'm in. Let's go to Elysium. I'll take you there myself. Thank you, Rex. Now place your hand on my chest. What? It are you sure? Showing us that the true nature of man as it is represented within the Xenoblade universe is inherently dualistic in nature, although it may not always appear as such, as it literally hides this reality between two dimension, and so the person seeking out both sides of the coin, in this case the player experiencing both XB1 and 2, will already know that the antagonists that seek this misguided ideal of unification are doomed to fail just as Klaus when he first activated the Condit to evolve mankind to the next level. In a sense through the connection between the two games the player is put into the same role as Shulk and Rex, reaching the mechanism and diving into the unknown to gain higher knowledge about the story's universe, 
and with both sides understood the series now seems to break down that very same barrier with the introduction of the Fog King and the strange dimensional rifts introduced in Future Connected. From this point of view it only makes sense if the next game, should it continue the story, focused on Klaus, as his fractured psyche between the absolute chaos of Zanza and the absolute order of the architect, embodies the very nature of everything the story has built up to this far. Klaus' fractured psyche is living proof of the foolishness behind the actions of both the Blade Eaters and Flesh Eaters, the antagonists who all in one shape or form seek the monad and resulting state of gnosis through their rejection of the collective, all of which is embodied in Malas Monado, born from Amalthus but now wielded for Jin. However this theme is not only embodied by the different eaters but also within the very nature of the relationship between the world of both Xenoblade 1 and 2. Klaus describes their existence and that of other parallel universes as blindly coexisting side by side, two sides of the same coin living in ignorance of one another, just as the eaters rejection of their counterparts. The way Klaus used the power of the Zohar for his failed divination ritual to evolve mankind draws heavy allusions to the alchemical magnum opus. In a broader sense this description of parallel worlds also symbolizes the mental and physical barriers between individuals. This is shown in the game's idea that every person is fighting their own war, in which the distinction between right and wrong lies purely within the eye of the beholder. These words also draw parallels to the conflicting nature of Rex's and Shulk's journey. In one universe Klaus is a force of evil, and in the other a benevolent creator. Thus the morality of killing Klaus Zenza is kept ambiguous. In a sense Shulk and his group resemble Malas and Jin more than they do Rex's gang. From our perspective good and evil are flipped within the two different universes, playing back into the overarching theme of duality and the morally great truth that lies somewhere in this undefinable space between the two realities. In one universe destroying Klaus is good and in the other evil but in the end nobody can tell which is the correct answers. Klaus trying to evolve humanity towards godhood by crossing into other realms is ultimately no different from Jin eating Laura's heart or from Amalthus taking all core crystals into himself. All of them did in one way or another strive for the same misguided ideal of unity, by claiming the knowledge of the ultimate moral truths for themselves. Yet in the end all three of them are reduced to lonely men, forced to endure and persist for eternity longing for their partner, lover, or mother. Their contrasting half they lost in this pursuit or whose loss became their catalyst for this pursuit of unity. The world was an unseemly place, though glimpses of beauty persisted. What should people live for? Who should they live for? They live for themselves. To harbor desires and struggle to realize them. That is the natural state of man. But I did not think that was good enough. I lost hope for mankind. I searched tirelessly for an outside solution. And one day I found it, the conduit. Why it chose to appear before us, I do not know. However, its existence presented a new possibility. Possibility? Our world was not the only one. Endless universes coexist, side by side, yet all completely unaware of one another. The conduit was our link to these foreign worlds. And I opened that forbidden gateway, praying that it would change the world. In contrast to this, the one, or rather two characters who were granted a second chance after their apotheosis event, and their resulting death, did so by returning as two uniquely different entities. At the end of the story Rex and Numa are the first pair that finally learns to let go and move on despite of the hurt, and thus the dialectic opposites are miraculously granted another chance to reunite in true unity, lifting each other up, rather than devouring one another in a foolish strive for eternal unity. Just as Jin, 
who while eternally united with Laura's art, wishes for nothing more than a single true moment with her, taking the good with the bad so two imperfect halves can lift one another up in true unity. The ending is a reflection of the symbol of the two one-winged angles which help each other fly that was prevalent since the very start of the franchise. By staying separate they become greater than the sum of their parts. One has to look no further than the connection between Driver and Blade to see this theme become manifest throughout the entire game, only to accumulate in the contradictory return of Pyra and Mithra as separate entities. Maybe this, and this. There you go. Thanks. Hey, do you want some wine? Oops, <laughs> you're too young. Silly me. Mithra, has something happened? What do you mean? It's just, you're a lot nicer than normal. Stop it. I'm always nice to you, aren't I? If, if you say so. Hey, Rex, come on. How can you sit down to eat without washing your hands first? <laughs> That's a faux pas. Go <laughs> wash your hands right now. Um, sorry. Pyra serves as a personification of everything that Mithra was bad at, her shadow or eyed so to speak, a split personality created from the mental trauma inflicted during the events of Torn of the Golden Country, and based on all the personality traits of Mithra's that the other characters complained about in Torna. This is why Pyra has a minor panic attack when Tora asks about the origin of her abilities, explaining this would have forced her to recall her past which is why she mentally blue screens and later references bad memories in Chapter 3. Their self-hatred is constantly hinted at throughout the story. Pyra having a hard time suppressing her past is also shown in her difficulties to regulate her own powers along with her constant need to apologize being a reflection of Mithra's lack of self-worth, resulting in Pyra crying once Rex tells her to stop apologizing after Vandham's death. While not yet understanding the true nature of her pain seeing her power as one of destruction rather than the power to protect. You apologize a lot. You know that. I guess you still feel guilty about the Aegis's power, right? But I don't want you to have to apologize anymore. I hope I can help you move past that. No. I know I can. Rex, I... Power depends on the heart of its wielder. That's what Vandam said. That's why your power is the power to protect. The power to keep everyone safe and smiling. I want to do the same. I'm going to be the kind of driver who can protect you in turn. I promise. Make a girl cry, that's not going to fly. Make a girl smile, you pass the trial. That's the third rule of the Salvager Code. Yeah? Mithra on the other hand is depicted as a naive child in Torna and although often overlooked the same also holds true for Malas who also lacks the maturity instilled in Blades through their continuous life cycles. In a sense Malas in Torna is just as psychologically childlike in nature as Mithra however in his case it manifests as a sort of schoolyard bully or in a burning ants with a magnifying glass type of deal, rather than the sassy and smug persona behind which Mithra hides her insecurities. During Poppy's awakening Pyra asks Tora to give Poppy a proper name. This is probably influenced by her own relationship, or lack thereof, with her own father, the elusive architect. In many ways Poppy serves as a mirror to the Aegis, the technological doomsday clock of a new age, showing that Aelrest is on its way to becoming another Mortha. I know, I know! Oh, okay, Artificial Blade, it's wakey-wakey time! That won't do, Tora. What, what, what Tora do wrong? You can't keep calling her Artificial Blade. As her creator, the least you can do is give her a proper name. Numa. No, I should call you Pyra and Mithra. What is it? Oh, um, well... Actually, friends, Tora did think of name for her. Very good name. Nice. Then I guess there's no problem. Well? Why don't you introduce us, Tora? Right away!
Poppy functions as a sort of little sister figure to Numeron corrupted by the demons that plague the Aegis, yet also fearing her own potential for destruction. Poppy is basically what a newborn Aegis could have been without the corruption infused in him from their drivers. This relationship is made more obvious in the final scene of the game where Poppy is positioned next to the two sisters. Tora also calls Rex Big Bro in Japanese which makes this implied familiar connection even clearer. How exactly artificial blades function is never explained but they are probably machine bodies with an actual core crystal placed into them that serve as something similar to a CPU. This wouldn't contradict Jin's refusal to awaken blades to fight for their cause, as the cores inside artificial blades are technically awakened, and can presumably be removed at any time. Though as I said before the nature of artificial blades is never really expanded upon. However as they are likely all built from salvaged ancient technology found in the Cloud Sea, which all originates from the ruins of Morth, they can likely be thought of as a lesser form of artifices, in the way they interact with the cores inside of them. Take an artifice and replace the conduit shaped part with a core crystal and you have an artificial blade. That's likely the simplest headcanon to explain how exactly they function. This would further juxtapose Mithra with Poppy, which the story plays into heavily by the end of the game. This shared nature between Mithra and Poppy further highlights the potential return of humanity's cyclical destruction. In a sense Tora is thus juxtaposed with Klaus, as they are both scientists that ended up making Robert Wafus real. It is. Poppy think this world achieved very big technological advancement. Many buildings. Many people. Everybody probably very happy here. But it doesn't matter how many fancy tricks they learn. Deep down, they're all the same. They thought they were making their lives better with all this stuff, but in the end, it destroyed them. No. It's just a ruin. Poppy was made by technological advancement too. Will Poppy... destroy the world as well? That's my problem too. If this world is father's world, and father made me to be as dangerous as any technology. Poppy and Mithra are the same? Yes. Kind of. But if... If Poppy destroys the world, Master Pan might get destroyed too. Maybe Mithra should destroy Poppy. Poppy? Tor created you. You could never do something like that. I know it. But... Hmm. Hey, let's make a promise. Uh, a promise? Yes. That's right, Poppy. Promise that... If you ever look like you're about to destroy the world... I will do... What you asked of me. But... In return... Can you promise me something? What would you like from Poppy? Mithra is scared of destroying the world too? Well, I'm doing my best to stop it coming to that. It's something else. It's... Huh? <laughs> no, actually. Nothing. I don't have a request right now. Can I think it over? Of course. Then let's promise. What's this? Master Pun taught it to Poppy. He said it's not on promise ritual. Lift hand up in air, then boop, together. I see. Numa and Poppy also serve as a metaphor for humanity's usage of tech and, or how they manifest divine knowledge through technology. Letting go of Numa and not misusing Poppy, the next generation's recreation of Klaus technology, an artificial blade, to repeat the same mistake as Jin, and not refusing to let go, is symbolic of letting go of claiming this higher divine knowledge about the nature of morality for oneself.
in other words, not abusing technology to play God, so not relying on Poppy, on Tekken, to regain his Numa, shows that the new Elrest, the new Elysium, has evolved beyond the Ouroboros cycle created by Klaus, but more on this later. However this also makes it extremely fitting that Rex originally broke his salvager's code and made Pyra cry, because he left her alone to go help repair Poppy without understanding Pyra's true feeling. This is also why Rex's fear of Pyra and Mithra taking on each other's personality is what finally breaks him. Them suddenly acting interchangeably negates everything he had learned throughout his journey. You're acting almost like Mithra today, Pyra. Did you scrub them properly? Yeah. They're clean. Great. Okay then. Let's eat. Thanks for the food. Um... It looks really good. Tastes even better. Of course it does. After all, I made it myself. Maybe I'll try my hand next time. Mithra, no. You know how that always ends. But carbon's good for you. Anyway, I want to do something nice for Rex, too. No cooking. Who's going to save the world if Rex gets the runs? You're so mean. It was only that one time. Um, it's okay, you two. I don't care who cooks. I'm just happy with... I'm happy with... so strange. <laughs> I don't even know what I'm doing here anymore. Everyone's all wrong. They all said I... But now you two... <laughs> Did... Did I go wrong somewhere? enough. Please, father. Xenoblade's story begins at the dawn of the 21st century when humanity discovered an alien artifact. This is the Condit, which appears identical to the Zohar that appeared in previous Eno titles. After discovering the Condit, the world unified under a one-world government to begin work on the orbital ring in the first low-orbit space station, to research the object outside of the Earth's atmosphere. The orbital ring is supported by three great towers, Radamanthus, and two other unnamed, unseen towers. As the space station was named Elysium we can make an educated guess that the other two towers are likely named Minos and Eseus, after the three judges of the dead in Greek mythology, with Elysium itself referring to the mythological Elysian fields. At this point I will have to go on a little tangent about a lot of extremely esoteric stuff that might at first seem completely unrelated, but it will all start to make sense in just a minute. The Radamanthus of Greek mythology is known as the right-hand man of Cronus, the god of time. Cronus or Saturninus, Saturn, are identified with the Hellenistic deity Aeon, the god of time, who is associated with the image of intertwining serpents. In the occult mystic schools the planet Saturn and the entity Aeon Telos are seen as synonymous with the Demiurge, the great architect of the universe. This is the Gnostic false creator god that enslaved humanity out of his own blindness to the true light of the Monad. The Gnostic Monad parallels both the Kabbalistic and soften the Hindi Parabrahman, as well as other similar concepts like the Tao. The Demiurge is simply a lesser emanation of this true divinity that fell from grace and created the physical world, believing himself to be the one true god, as he is incapable of perceiving that which exists above him. The Demiurge was born from another emanation of the Monad, Sophia the Wisdom Goddess, 
who in her desire to become like the monad itself tried to reproduce with herself instead of her respective counterpart, to mimic the monad's ability to birth something out of nothing, which in turn led to the creation of the fallen mockery of divinity that is embodied through the Demiurge. This story could be seen as a cautionary tale of being blinded by one's own desire for knowledge. Similar in nature to Icarus flying too close to the sun, it is because of the Demiurge's association with Saturn that this planet is featured so heavily throughout Xenoblade 1, where it is ever-present in Shulk's dream sequences, and why it is the first planet within the memory space, as it represents the Bionis, or the prison reality controlled by the false creator god Zanza for which Shulk is freeing himself by moving beyond Saturn and back to Earth, the origin of the true Minato that is Albus. That's why the Saturn Matrix or the idea of the profane is tied to earthly concepts such as gravity and the image of the square, as they are symbols of how our senses experience Earth, the prison reality of humanity. On Earth we are bound by gravity and even though the planet is a globe we perceive it as a basically flat plane while standing on it. Hence on the flip side the monad is associated with the concept of levitation and the image of the circle, because outer space has no gravity and we perceive other planets as spherical when they are observed through a telescope. Considering this it becomes very interesting that the comet, mankind is linked to divine unity, had to be studied outside of the world's orbit. From this viewpoint, the view of one who studies the comet, Earth is now observed as more spherical, a step closer to the divine, and gravity becomes more artificial. Furthermore the orbital ring around Earth also represents a fake, man-made, ring of Saturn, and with its creation mankind eventually became enslaved by the ego of a man perceiving himself as God, who created a false reality around this twisted self-image. Xenoblade 2 ultimately ends with the destruction of said ring, which is symbolically connected to the Ouroboros and the alchemical cyclical self-destruction of mankind, but more on that later, as the Demiurge represented in Zanza is just a manifestation of mankind's megalomania. It is very ironic that the one person, misunderstanding the architect, or perhaps understanding another side of him all too well, ended up turning into the spitting image of that same hubris, entrapping the world in a similar cycle, a fake reality of absolute control. You're speaking nonsense, boy. Now is the hour of their doom. You leave me no choice but to perform your duty for you. Destroying Jin and Torna? We're only trying to stop them, not kill them. Can sway them with words of reason. Well, yes! Jin told me what happened, what happened 500 years ago. And you were the cause of it, weren't you, Praetor? I was nothing but the mouthpiece of the architect. When I meet him, I'll ask him myself about me, about Pyra and Mithra. That is not your right. It is Again? You defy me again? Malphite, you won't get what you want. I... I'm... Rex's blade! Th that's right. Rex, you're the Aegis's driver. There's nothing he can do that you can't. Does that mean... Rex, it's true. Power depends on the heart of its wielder. Right? In many ways Amalthus is this game's version of Zanza and could have potentially, under different circumstances, become a figure more akin to the architect, as we will see later, although he still had the potential for either outcome, falling prey to either his ad or superego, the words spoken to him in Torn of the Golden Country ultimately sealed Amalthus' fate, and so, although he sees himself as an avatar of the architect's will, he really became an avatar of Zanza, so, in a sense, 
he was right about the architects will after all. Ultimately he too represents one of the alternate possibilities spoken about by the architect, if blades represent the unconscious feelings of their drivers and Amalthus also acts as a metaphorical blade for the architect, a reflection of the unseen unconsciousness of the architect that resides within another universe. While not a literal blade he has certainly transformed himself into a living weapon that acts on the desires of Klaus missing half. By staying a pacifist, the architect forced others to act for him, thus creating that which he feared most, a man just like him. That's the tragic irony behind a Klaus character. While he went through all this trouble of creating blades to observe and measure the emotional and psychological aspects of humanity it was his own inability to engage and bond with others that turned Amalthus into another Zanza. While Malas is an embodiment of the shadow cast by Amalthus' subconsciousness, and thus a slave to Amalthus' will, Aeon represents his true Minato a means to break free from that influence. So it is only during this final battle that Malas is ever truly in control of his own actions. Although he carries the ideals of Amalthus engine within him, this is the first and last time he truly acts out of his own free will. Malas being a prisoner to Amalthus, who is this universe's equal to Zanza, is probably also why Malas is the only Aegis whose sword is openly referred to as Minato. Because this time around it is the villain who has to liberate himself from the will of the false god. The connection between Aeon and Amalthus becomes clearer when we consider that the Demiurge, Saturninus or Cronus, represents limited time, while Aeon represents circular never-ending time. The deity Aeon is associated with the intertwining snakes of the Caduceus, which are present in the design of the artifice. Furthermore the Moniad is also sometimes given the name Ian Tullius or Aeon Telus, while the meaning of Telos is difficult to explain a Telos basically refers to something's end state. Hence Aeon represents both the man-made cyclical destruction of the world of Elrest, caused by the Savitarites, Klaus, Amalthus and Torna, but under the control of Malas, Aeon also represents the Aeon Telos, the wish for complete extinction Malas has inherited from Amalthus and Jin, but is now carrying out of his own free will by taking control over Aeon. Malas obtains Gnosis, by breaking free from Jin's and Amalthus' influence, and obtaining his own free will. This double play of Aeon and Aeon Telus, along with the curling twin snakes motif, the double color scheme, and the irony of his name being Logos, all of this makes the final boss a symbol of the Moniad, or humanity's forced evolution into a godhead, which is why his strongest attack is named after Prometheus but more on that later. In another sense we could also say that by bringing Aeon to its end state, destroying it, it's Tullus, Aelrest is transformed into the true Elysium, by purging the megalomania of mankind from Aelrest. The true meaning behind this symbolism will become more apparent later on in this video. For all intents and purposes Aeon is very much a thematic reimagination of Xenogir's Deus. It symbolizes the Demiurge's destructive force which is part of the alchemical process of the great work, the flame of destruction from which the phoenix rises, reaching Gnosis and becoming as gods, while Amalthus, Jin and Malas all ended up arriving at the same conclusion. Their conflict arises from their opposing ideologies which causes this alchemical clash of moralities that ultimately results in the synthesis between their reasons embodied through Rex's ideology emerging victorious. He no longer wanted anything. He didn't even want to live anymore. And despite that, his life was the one thing he hadn't lost. Because he couldn't! The thought of you forgetting me, it's like one heart is being ripped in two. Words can be a curse. That curse must be kept in time down here. A wretched tale, isn't it? This whole world is a wretched place. Do not forget that you two are a part of that world. If it were not for you, for Amalthus, both Jin and Laura's lives may have taken quite different paths. Exactly. That's exactly it. You've gotten smarter with age, huh? I'm a wretched being, too. A hideous monster, far beyond saving. So... Let's end this now. Don't you feel anything? Father Sadness, the world he longed for. How could I? 
That isn't my role in this world. There are the obvious allusions to Norse mythology with the world tree of Drasil, the Helhumesk Morda, and Ophion, the Nidhagr Narling on the world tree, the second serpent of Norse mythology, the Midgard serpent Jormungandr, which encircles the entire world, could be an inspiration behind the orbital ring which encircles the planet itself. Strangely enough the Jormungandr is also depicted as biting its own tail and is said to start Ragnarok once it releases said tail, which is surprisingly similar to the Ouroboros, and fits perfectly into this idea of circular time, Aeon, or destruction associated with the Demiurge's role in the alchemical magnum opus, represented by the very image of the Ouroboros. Fascinating how all these unrelated images actually fit into one another. This synchronicity is of course a key aspect of the Unus Mundus, the Jungian collective unconscious which heavily inspired both Lagos and Numa as we will see later. There are even more allusions to this Ouroboros cycle encoded within the story of Xenoblade 2, the world's continued cycle of self-destruction which is referred multiple times throughout the game. For example Jin claims that humans will turn Elysium into another Mortha due to this endless cycle of self-destruction that lies at the base nature of humanity. Funnily enough Gin was ultimately proven to be correct, as Elysium had already been destroyed long ago. It could also be said that the blades themselves, and the way in which their data is processed by the Trinity processor through the death and rebirth of blades, and how this cycle is abused by Amalthus, is yet another instance of the Ouroboros imagery within the game. I didn't know there were monsters like that. Nothing like all rest, for sure. They've got a rotten knack of healing themselves. Almost like blades. I don't know, but maybe they're leftovers from the culture that created us. This is the architect's world. I guess nothing should come as a surprise. I wonder what kind of person he is. I didn't get to meet him. I mean, I have fragments of memories, blurred images. That's why I want to meet him. To create this awesome civilization? I can't imagine. Awesome? This? Huh? It's a heap of smashed up crap. Look at it. It was melted by a warhead or something. All that's buried here is the hubris of mankind. If the architect was born here, then he must be as flawed as any other. No different from you people of all rest. Why do you hate us so much? What is it that you think we've done? Jin! Besides its Yggdrasil imagery, the world tree also has an obvious Tower of Babel aspect to it. Here humanity once came together under a one-world government to build a tower that would pierce into the realm of God, only for humanity to be smitten down and divided across the world, or in Xenoblade's case divided across different dimensions. Which is a fitting change since their tower tried to pierce into the multiverse rather than just the firmament. There is also an obvious fall of man element to this part of the story with Klaus and Galia eating from the fruit of knowledge of good and evil to become as gods, and how their quest for Gnosis is ultimately rejected by God, or in this case Antos, existence, the one part of the Trinity processor that malfunctioned and cast them out of Elysium, though in this case it is obviously the male part falling to temptation with the snake being his scientific drive for knowledge, which in his case we can quite literally call scientism since he revered the Condit as a divine gift from God. Galia on the other hand retained a purely scientific viewpoint about its existence saying that it is simply a gate to parallel universes, as if that was nothing more than a scientific phenomena that could be studied and understood, rather than one that deserved to be revered. This switcheroo makes sense considering that it is the male aspect which is associated with the demiurgic potentiality within humanity. 
And given that the gnosis sought after by the antagonists of this story is actually just self-delusional supremacy disguised as virtue, even the characters' physical locations feed back into this larger story and helps empathize their view of the world and the characters they are. Klaus is located in the world tree in the low orbit station, as a scientist he is depicted as quite literally being aloft, removed from the plight of the individual. From his position on high, humanity becomes nothing more than another statistic. He's like a person observing an ant colony, as such he judges humanity with broad strokes, blinded by the bigger picture he is unable to appreciate the good that exists on the individual level, as such he deems them as impure as he watches mankind burn the world beneath him. Thus he looks towards heaven and the conduct's potential to transmute humanity to a higher plane of existence. In this moment Klaus rejected the duality and imperfections of humanity choosing to only see the bad within it, ironically leading him towards the same short-sightedness he condemned mankind for in the first place. Thus Klaus opens Pandora's box unleashing chaos upon the world, and so the conduit falls into slumber until Rex and Numa's connection awakens it and releases the hope left within it. While half of Klaus remains in this world to be confronted with the errors of his ways his other half ends up in a new universe. From this second version's perspective he was proven right in his actions, and so he becomes the demiurge figure Zanza, taking on Tos, Aja, the will or holy father aspect of the trinity processor with him, transforming it into his perverted view of the divine spark, the Minato. By the end of Xenoblade this perverted worldview is purified through Shulk's awakening of the one true Minato, which rids the world of the insanity of the Gnostic God-Man. Meanwhile Klaus' other half persisted in the ruined world he created. This world has been quite literally removed from the unity, the Aja aspect of the Holy Trinity, as Antos disappeared from the world, only leaving behind the pure duality of Logos and Numa, who are in an esoteric sense very much synonymous with Jesus Christ, the Word of God made flesh, and the Holy Spirit, the Gnostic Mary Magdalene or Sophia. But to truly understand the connection between Logos and Numa and how everything in the game connects on a deeper level we have to take a moment to look into the basics of alchemy and how it connects to the concepts of the Christ Logos, the Spirit Numa and the Anus Mundus. This is... You can't come here. Charming. So you're making the rules now, huh? 